Hello there, Pursuing Freedom friends. Thanks for tuning in today. Love having you here as always. I'm really excited today to introduce you to Kyle Whistle out of San Diego, California. He's with EXP Realty and um, Kyle has been in the business a long, long time, but started as a young pup back at the age of 19. And we're gonna dig in a little bit to everything from the journey from commercial to residential, following your parents' footsteps, all that good stuff. But uh, I won't waste any time, we'll just jump in. So Kyle, tell us a little bit about you, how, when, why you got into real estate, and we got a, we got a big journey to cover in a short amount of time here. You got a lot of yeah, cool stuff going on. For, for sure, so we'll, we'll dive in. Um, I grew up in a real estate family. Uh, my dad had been in the business since before I was born. Um, so I was definitely born into the industry. Growing up was not the biggest fan of real estate. Uh, my dad was one of the top realtors here in San Diego, mostly on the commercial side. Um, and a lot of times his efforts in the real estate side of things affected his time with me. Um, and so, you know, I remember all those times if he wouldn't show up to a game or wouldn't show up the days he was supposed to have me or was late or whatever, like that stuff really um, affected me as a child um, to where it made me resent real estate as I was growing up. And so I never in a million years thought I would get into real estate. Uh, but once I went to college, I think I was either sophomore or junior in college at UCSD here in San Diego. And my dad kept pushing me, you need to buy something, you need to buy something, you need to buy something. And I was like, dad, I work at a movie theater. I scoop popcorn. Like I can't buy anything. And, you know, back in the early 2000s, they just put a, you know, a mirror under your nose, you fog it and they give you a loan. And uh, they gave me a loan for a half a million dollar property when I was making, you know, nothing. Um, it was totally crazy, but I was like a manager. And so on a stated income loan back then, that was all you needed. And so they gave me a $500,000 loan, um, sold the property a few months later, I netted 17,000 bucks. And so scooping popcorn, 17,000 bucks, it was a pretty easy decision. Um, and so I then reached out to my dad and said, I know I said I'd never do real estate, but I can't resist this kind of money. Let's talk. And so I uh, joined my dad. And again, he was on the commercial side of things. So mostly apartment buildings, some shopping centers here and there. And so I joined him on the commercial side of things and worked with him for about five or six years and learned a ton from him. He's an amazing negotiator. Um, so really learned a lot about negotiating, learned a lot about connecting people, all of that stuff while I was with him. Um, did not learn anything about technology. I mean, it was insane. It, when he wanted to send a client a property, he would print it out. Then he had a post-it note that he would put over the other agent's name. Then he'd stamp his name on a post-it note and then fax it to his clients. Like that was his strategy of delivering listings to his clients. And it was pretty painful. And I, you know, I tried to show them like, look, you just click this email button and it sends it to them and it's in color and they can actually see the details. Like it was a trip working with him, um, but it went really well. I mean, we, we did a lot of business and most of what we were doing was selling apartment buildings to people that would then uh, buy the apartment building, kick everybody out, redo all the units and then sell them off individually to as condos. And that was an amazing run here in San Diego. People made millions on top of millions doing that. Um, the problem was somebody would start out with an eight unit building, then they'd make a bunch of money. They do like a 16 unit building and a 32 unit building. Before you knew it, they were doing like 300 unit buildings. And the city kind of freaked out a little bit because they were running out of apartments to rent. And so they put some rules in place that basically made it impossible to do that anymore. The issue that happened there was that the uh, price of apartment buildings shot through the roof. And if you couldn't sell them as condos, the rents were down here. So it didn't make any sense to own an apartment building with the rents down here. So all my investors were saying like, this is stupid. I don't want to buy any more apartment buildings, um, but I'm open to buy some houses because this was right around 2007, 2008 when everything was crashing and there was a ton of REOs and short sales and foreclosures all over the place. And so my investors were saying, well, what about, you know, buying some of these houses? I don't, I could go buy five houses cheaper than I can buy a five unit apartment building. And so then I looked around and I saw that some of these agents would have, you know, 100, 200, 500 listings, you know, between short sales and REOs all at the same time. And I was like, that would be pretty cool, right? Like to have that much inventory as opposed to commercial, I was closing a deal like every two or three months. And there were guys out there closing a deal every, you know, two or three days. And so I saw that opportunity and told my dad, I appreciated everything that he taught me and decided to make the jump over to residential on my own. And so I did that um, in 2008 and started out on my own with an assistant. I've always had an assistant from day one. I've always lived by the motto, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. 
Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea how people function without having an assistant. It's insane to me. Um, they're doing so much minimum wage work. It's insane. And they justify it by the fact that they're staying busy. But if they would take that time that they're spending doing assistant work and instead spend it prospecting, um, I mean, they've, there's some studies and a bunch of them have different numbers, but the study that I've always followed, you know, says that your time prospecting is worth approximately $2,700 an hour. But yet you want to go do $15 an hour work. Like, what the hell are you doing? Um, yeah. We'll just justify it in their head because they're busy that it's okay. But if they would actually realize the opportunity cost of what they're doing, um, they could make, a, you know, significantly more money in this business. So um, started out with an assistant initially and um, doing a lot of short sales because short sales were a little bit easier to get right away. Started working a lot of the REO relationships at the time with asset managers, going to conferences, networking. Um, then all the REO stuff started to flow in as well. So I had a lot of short sale listings, a lot of REO listings. And then at that point, I knew that I could not service all of the business with just me and an assistant. So I tried bringing some buyer's agents in, but I never really knew what the hell I was doing. I didn't understand the importance of speed to lead. I didn't understand the importance of follow-up plans or anything like leads would come in. And like once a week, I'd take all the leads that, from that week and send them over to one of my agents. Like, here you go, follow up with them, like weekly not like within a second within right. a week. It was crazy. Um, so needless to say, they never converted any of those. Um, so that wasn't working. And then I was sitting around one day on a black Friday and computers were on sale from Dell for like 200 bucks. And I was just like, fuck it. I'm going to just, I'm going to go big. And I bought 10 computers and I was in a hundred square foot office at the time. <laughs> and I was like, all right, cool. Now I got 10 computers. Now I need like an office for these computers. Um, so then I went and leased up like a 2000 square foot office. I was like, all right, I got office and I got computers and I need people. And that first year I pretty much hired anybody and everybody. I just wanted to fill the office up. So I had people from like 20 to 120 years old. Like I just literally hired anybody and kind of had the mindset of like, let's just give them a chance and, and see what works. But what ended up happening is we're very, very tech based. And so some of these um, older agents were just struggling so much with the technology that we were spending more time on tech support than we were on actual, you know, business. And I realized that first year, I lost well over a hundred thousand dollars that first year. Um, that was kind of my learning lesson to understand culture and understand the importance of putting the right people on the right seat on the bus. Mm -hmm. And so we got rid of those agents that didn't fit. And again, not that the 120 year old agent that doesn't even use email can't be successful. Um, there's an agent here in San Diego who's 80 years old, does not know how to use a computer and is still one of the top 10 agents in the entire city. So Ow. it's not that they can't, they can't be successful without using the technology. That's just not a fit for us. And so you got to know what's a fit for you. What's your culture? What's the right fit? Um, the year that we figured that out, we went from 82 transactions to 242 transactions. So our biggest leap year ever was when I really started to understand that and started to understand the right people that work within our framework that fit our culture. Um, that was when we really had a huge leap in our business. So what kind of um, mentoring and coaching did you receive when you made the leap into residential from commercial? Because it sounds like, I mean, you've, you've obviously covered a lot of ground there, but you've come a long way and you've learned a lot in the process and, you know, knowing how to act, like how, and the need to have an assistant and then going out and then, building up the team and, and learning as you go. I mean, did you have a coach all the way through? Were you just learning from books, from friends, colleagues? Yeah, like I mean, I've always been education-based. Um, so like for me, whenever I'm in the car, I'm not listening to the radio. I'm listening to podcasts or listening slash watching YouTube videos. Like I'm always learning. I love to constantly be learning new things and learning ways to improve. So when I first got in, I knew short sales was the opportunity. So I just did some research and found out who was, you know, the go-to um, educator when it came to short sales. And back at the time, there was something called CDPE, Certified Distressed Property Expert was a big thing. And then there was another group called Short Sale Genius that was um, doing a lot of short sale education. So I just started going to events from both of those. And those guys really taught me the ropes when it came to short sales and, and how to get into that. And then I knew when it came to REO that the thing was to go to these big conferences, um, Rio Mac, Five Star, some of that stuff. I knew that's where all the asset managers were that assigned the listings. And so I just started going to those conferences because 
I knew that's where those people were. And if that's where they are, that's where I needed to be. And so go to started going to those. And so that was what kind of helped me get up and running initially. And then as that stuff started to fade away, I realized I needed to make that shift. Um, I didn't want to stay on that boat and go down with it. So um, at that point, that's when I started coaching with Tom Ferry. And so I moved over to his coaching organization um, and I learned a ton with Tom. Um, it got to a point though, when I needed to grow my team out bigger, um, at that point, Tom didn't really have a team coaching program. And so I then looked around at well, who's the best coach for teams. And at that time, Corcoran Coaching, um, which was led by Bob Corcoran at the time, um, I reached out to them and they had an amazing system of here's the people to hire, here's how to pay them, here's the interview questions, boom, boom. Like it was perfect. So wow. um, that worked really, really well. And that kind of helped me build my team up bigger. And then um, Tom Ferry came out with his own team coaching program. And so moved back to Tom because I love Tom. I love his, um, he's very innovative. He's very cutting edge. You know, he's ahead of the curve of what's happening in the industry and in the market. And so we've been with Tom Ferry ever since. So almost from day one in this industry, I've always had a coach and I've always had an assistant. I've literally never worked a day in this industry without either having some level of coaching and or an assistant. Awesome. And what company were you with when you were starting the, the team building process? I was really? always independent. So I've been independent my entire career until last year. Um, we finally made a move over to a brokerage. So we moved over to eXp Realty last year. So what was the name of your own business before that? We were just Whistle Realty before. Okay. And then now we're just Whistle Realty Group, brokered by eXp Realty. So, um, and how many so, agents or how many people do you have on your team nowadays? Uh, 25. So we have 25 agents now, and then we have about 10 support staff. And are you currently still selling? I do. I still get a high off of it. Um, so I know a lot of people, they want to get to the point they, they don't go on appointments or anything anymore. But one, that's the highest dollar per hour activity I could do is going on appointments. And two, it's probably one of the most fun things for me. And mm -hmm. in all honesty, I prefer going on and I hardly ever work with buyers. It's primarily sellers. Um, but when I go on a listing appointment, I prefer going on an appointment where I'm competing against other people as opposed to where I just walk in and get the listing. Um, to me, it's fun. I love competition. I've played sports since I was like four. Um, so it's just kind of ingrained in me to be a competitor. So when I am going on a listing appointment and I know I'm competing against somebody, I'll even ask the seller, like, can we just, you know, do the, a group meeting? Like, let's just interview together. Let's save you some time. Because I would rather sit shoulder to shoulder with my competition because I know I can smoke them. Um, and that's fun for me. Like I, I totally get a high off of it. If I can beat one of my biggest competitors, that's so much more fun to me than just getting a lay down listing. Right. So how many, um, uh, do you kind of try to limit the number of transactions that you can personally handle? Because with 25 agents and 10 admin, you've also got a lot on your plate in terms of being the leader and coaching and mentoring, you know, now that you've moved into that role, I assume that's a big part of your responsibility, right? Yeah. So I do one a week on average. So my goal is always to do somewhere in that 50 to 55 range is what I try to you know, strive for with production. And that keeps me balanced. That's enough to um, keep me out there, keep me active. I, as a leader, I like to be in the trenches with my team because it really helps me understand exactly what they're going through. Because reading about what's happening in the market versus experiencing what's happening is two different things. And so when I'm actually going out and I'm hearing the objections, right? Like our market is shifting significantly in San Diego right now. It's good for me to be out there at the table, at the living room table or dining room table with a, a seller or a buyer and actually hearing the objections that, you know, based on what they're hearing in the media. So I think it's really good that I can experience it. And I think my team looks up to me and is like, wow, Kyle does all of this other stuff and still goes out and sells 50 homes a year. Like, what am I doing selling 10? So what does it look like with your team in terms of, are you pretty well scheduled and in, in terms of uh, the time you spend with them and the coaching that you provide them? What does that look like with your group? Yeah, I mean, I'm super, super structured with my entire life. Um, I really focus on three things now. Uh, one is going on appointments. Two is media. So I do a lot of like radio, I do TV, we have like video shows. Um, and I do a lot of public speaking now as well. So it's like one third appointments, one third media, one third running my team. Um, and I, like I said, I have 10 people helping. So we have um, two media and marketing managers that do all of our photography, videography, and marketing. I've got an assistant. I've got a finance manager, a listing manager, a transaction manager. Um, what else do I have? 
I have a sales manager. Um, I have an operations manager. Like I have people helping me with everything. So like I said, I'm willing to buy time. So I have a half million plus dollar payroll, but that payroll allows me the ability to be home between five and six every day. It allows me to spend time with my wife and with my daughter um, and still make a healthy living. Now, you know, we sell, we did almost 5 million GCI last year. I'm not netting two, $3 million. There's other realtors that net two or $3 million, but I'm working 40 ish hours a week, you know, and I'm getting to live the lifestyle that I want. And that's more important to me than how much money I actually net. That's interesting. And I was going to ask you about that because you, you know, the real estate business can be very consuming and you kind of alluded to that in your childhood, having experienced that. So it's interesting to hear that, you know, you do have that priority on time and that time freedom is, I mean, what is the point, right? What is the point of having a successful business if you're not creating space to enjoy, you know, the luxuries that it can afford you, basically? 100%. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, in terms of, you mentioned earlier about having a, a very tech-based company. And I'm curious, does your, do your lead generation activities, are they, are, is it mostly leads that you're, are you, I mean, are you doing database marketing? Are you doing referral marketing? Or when you say tech-based, what is that, what does that encompass exactly? I mean, tech-based is really leveraging technology to increase our conversion rate on the opportunities that we have. So um, a prime example, and this is where I see a lot of team leaders make a huge mistake, is um, when a lead comes in, like, what is your process? How does that get handled? Um, what a lot of people do, like, let's talk about a phone lead, for example. Um, a phone lead comes in, and some people have a round robin where, you know, it rings this agent, this one, and the next agent, the next one, or it rings all the agents simultaneously. The thing is, when your agents are answering the phone, they're out on the road half the time, and they have a good conversation with somebody, but then they never put that lead into the CRM. And that creates two problems. One, they're snaking you, whether you know it or not. When a phone lead comes in, that's the hardest lead for you to possibly track. Your agents are snaking you on some of those leads. So you need to realize that it's very easy for an agent to say a lead came into an open house if it came in over the phone because you have no way of knowing. Um, so you run into that problem. The other problem with them not putting it in a CRM is that they don't follow up with it. You know, they have a great phone conversation. They write it on like a napkin or a piece of paper. And then they just forget about it. And the lead never goes in the system and never gets followed up with and it doesn't get converted. So um, we love Jesse over at Call Action. He built out an amazing phone system for us. To now when a lead comes in, as soon as an agent answers that, the lead automatically gets imported into our uh, CRM. Hmm. So now one, it's there for tracking. So our agents don't snake us. And two, it's there for our agents to follow up with it. So in case they forget to put it in the CRM, it's automatically there. So the next time they log into their email, it's like, oh yeah, I talked to John Smith yesterday. And now they can grab their little napkin with the notes and put all those notes into the system and stay on top of it. So um, things like that. And, and I mean, that system, for example, also will automatically follow up with the lead for you. There's a little bit of AI to a certain extent built into it where it'll say, hey, I'm tied up in a meeting right now. Um, should I call, text, or email you? And then based on their response, it sends another text message to them. So some of those things like that with automation, I'm a really, really big fan of. Um, I love like Zapier is my, one of my best friends in the world because now I can integrate a bunch of different systems and flow all that data into a single CRM. Uh, so I'm really, really big on utilizing stuff like that and using technology to automate as much as we can in the process. Is Zapier the name of your CRM? No, Zapier is, um, so every, most tech systems out there have what's called an API. And so that's like the keys and um, Zapier connects two systems together. So um, let's say call action, we could take information from call action, connect it to Commission Inc or Boomtown. Um, and that's how you can get data from one source into another, or we do like a lot of event marketing. Um, we do like speaking events. And so people will sign up in Eventbrite and then Zapier will push that into the CRM. And then at the end of my event, right, my, or my um, speaking engagement, then some, we do a, a survey at the end of that with like a type form or a survey monkey. And then I can have that through Zapier also feed into the CRM. So Zapier just connects everything together. So it's kind of the hub and everything flows through and then it spits it back out where it needs to go. 
So you're speaking a lot of language that I, I don't comprehend, but no, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning, but um, I'm curious because, okay, I, like I, I love all this technology. I use a lot of it. I leverage it as much as I can, but it sucks the life out of me to learn it. Like we have a very robust CRM, which can do just about anything. And it took me like six months to program it because I knew that it had to be programmed by me because I, I needed the workflows to go the way that I want, that I know that our process flows. I needed to create that process. I needed to write all the automated emails that go out throughout the process. Um, I, I felt it had to have my voice and my stamp of whatever, but it was like so painful. Do you enjoy this stuff? Is that like- Yeah, I used to like build uh, what would be considered like hacker programs back in the day on computers when I was like 10, 11 years old. Um, so I used to be into computer programming and stuff like that. So that used to be fun to me. Um, and now it kind of is fun because I can utilize those skills to make money. So yeah. I do like figuring out like how to connect systems together, how to automate things, because the more you rely on your agents to do things, the less money you're going to make. So anything I can do to automate some of the process for them, you know, obviously you still got to actually talk to people. It's still a contact sport, but if I can automate you know, getting leads into systems and moving them through, you know, the funnel and all that stuff. I'm all for it. It's, it's just about efficiency. And how, like, how would you respond when, especially an agent who wants to have more automation in their process, but can't seem to find the time. And they would say to you, you know, how do you find the time? How do you find the time to learn these new softwares and technologies and then implement them and then get everybody on your team on board with utilizing it. Cause the, I mean, 35 people is a lot of people to have to like now impart your passion for this new system or this new way of doing things. Like, yeah, you gotta have somebody on your team who runs that for you. So now I'm more, you know, if you look at like the EOS model, there's a visionary and an integrator, like now behind all these ideas, I'm more the visionary with them. And then I have an integrator who makes them happen. So, now, if I'm at a conference, like the reason I love Tom Ferry is he's super innovative and cutting edge and he's always ahead of the curve with technology. So if Tom talks about a technology and I'm like, ooh, that could be good for our business. Now I can take that vision, pass that on to my integrator. They can go out, they can do the research, figure out how to implement it, if it's a fit for us, all of that. So now I don't have to be the one actually integrating these things. Now I can just be more of the visionary. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And that's pretty much what I do is like, I get a lot of ideas probably to much to the chagrin of my assistant who I just like vomit ideas all over. I heard this great idea. We just need to do this. Can you figure out how to make that happen? <laughs> so totally. my coach always referred to it as the director of who, like you need to have someone on your team that's the director of who, so that when you get another brilliant idea that has to be implemented like yesterday, that you can reach out to somebody and say, I have this idea and either they can, figure it out and handle it, or they can figure out who should handle it. So they become the director of who. Exactly. Love it. But um, now you mentioned video when we were chatting before we started recording. So I know that you're really heavy in video. Like how do you leverage video to build your brand? And um, is it specifically, you know, real estate focused or is there a bigger vision for your brand, Kyle Whistle or Whistle Realty? Yeah, I would say a little bit of all of that. So for me, farming is great. I love farming. Um, you know, I come, when I got into this industry, I have always run on streams of listings, not like I'm going to go sell Bill's house and Bill's going to refer me to Mary and then Mary's going to refer me to John. Like that just doesn't work for me. So I've always thought about this business as far as getting streams of listings. So like during the REO days, if I could get in and get a relationship with the asset manager at Fannie Mae, once I get that relationship, that's a stream of listings for years to come. I don't have to go get that relationship then another and another. As long as I maintain that relationship, the listings are gonna keep coming. I look at farming the same way. So now I just need to get in a relationship with my farm and the listings will keep coming from it, much like when I got in a relationship with an asset manager. And so we do all the traditional farming stuff, you know, mailers and open houses and calls and door knock and all of that stuff. But we also added in the digital component, especially via video. Um, so what I refer to as digital farming. And so we came out, we've, we're on our third show now. Um, we seem to get about two year run out of every show that we do. The first show we started doing was called Santee Saturdays. And um, Santee is a community within San Diego where we do a lot of business. And we interviewed local business owners every single week. So every Saturday we'd come out with a new video 
It could be anywhere from the local restaurant, the coffee shop, the chiropractor, the accountant, the insurance person, the personal trainer. Um, every week we would do an interview with a local business owner. And that was really fun. We did a hundred episodes of that show. We had over a million views on that show over that hundred show run. So it was really, really fun. We had a blast with it. Um, once we got to episode 100, we realized we were running out of businesses to do. And so we had to, you know, come up with our second show. And so what we did is looked back at those first hundred shows, figured out which were the ones that had the most engagement. And it was almost always our food shows. And right now, if you scroll through your Instagram feed, it's one of four things. It's either food, fashion, fitness, or family. Those are the four things that really resonate when it comes to social that people engage with. And so we picked food. I love food. I'm a foodie. And we saw we had the results there that food always did really well in those videos. And so we decided with our second show is let's just focus on video, but we couldn't just do our one little community. So now we focus on the whole Eastern part of San Diego County and came out with a show called East County Eats. And so now instead of one city, now it encompasses like six cities. And so we had much more options for restaurants to do. And so we did two years of that show. And that was just interviewing a local business or a local restaurant every week for two straight years. And that was really fun because like people that own restaurants are amazing people because they are the biggest connectors out there. Like they love people. Nobody gets in the restaurant industry to get rich. Like it is the one of the lowest profit margin businesses in the world. They do it because they love to make people happy. They love to serve people. They love to connect people. And so we have relationships now with all the local business owners. And then now we have relationships with all the local restaurant owners as well, um, which has been really, really powerful. That leads to a lot of referrals. It leads to a lot of um, business directly with these business owners, because now we go in there and we do this amazing video about their business for free and then put it out there into the community. And the community loves the videos too, because we're not coming out there like every other realtor, like I'm standing in front of a three bedroom, two bathroom home. That's $500,000. Like that shit's boring. People don't want to yeah. watch that. So now it's a way for me to get in front of my target audience on a weekly basis with content they actually care about. And I'm getting a relationship with the business owner at the same time. Um, so that's been an amazing. So we've done four years on our new show that's getting ready to launch. It's called Everything East County. So now we're expanding beyond the restaurants. So we'll still have a focus on restaurants, um, but we're also going to start doing a lot of coverage of local events, what's happening within the community, and some like little known facts about the community. Like, did you know about the hidden stairs on Mount Nevo? And it's a really fun place to come exercise and get a killer view? Or did you know that this trail that you've been hiking on all these years used to be a military base? And here's the history of the military base. Um, so now we're doing even more community driven content and the community loves it. Like they just gave me an award for Santee Young Professional of the Year. And it's primarily because of those videos that we do because we're putting the spotlight on a community that a lot of people didn't know about and, you know, the community loves it, the, the restaurant owners and business owners all love it. So that's been huge for our farming. It's really put us on the map. And people say, well, like, how many leads did you get from it? It's not just about that. It's a branding play more than anything. But what's really cool is like now if I do a street fair um, and set up a booth or I do an open house, like people walk in and they instantly are in a relationship with me. Because before somebody buys or sells with you, they've got to know you, like you and trust you. I've already knocked those three out before I've ever even met this person via that video. Because once they walk in, they feel like they know me at that point. They like me because I'm, you know, giving them content in the community and they trust me because I've shown that I'm a, a person that's a part of the community and putting the spotlight on it. So I'm instantly in rapport when I meet people to where I don't have to convince them that I'm a good person that they should work with me. Now I just have to sell them the house. Yeah. Well, it's so crazy. I, I'm wondering if maybe this is why I had to track you down and get you on the show because when I was getting going with my business, I did something very similar, but it was pre-video. It was just basically intentionally re reaching out to the database, getting referrals for local businesses that they know, like, and trust, and then engaging with them and then proactively marketing them back to my big database and using that as like a snowball effect of activity, which just resulted in you being in activity and in engagement with people and you never really even have to talk about mortgage or real estate because, you know, those come as a byproduct. The transactions come as a byproduct of just trying to help people and be a connector. And I think that video is so huge. And 
there's so much fear around video with so many people, but you just hit the nail on the head because ultimately by the time they meet you, they've already decided they know, like, and trust you. And if they saw your video and they didn't know, like, and trust you, they're probably not going to know, like, and trust you if they haven't seen you on video and now they meet you for the first time, right? Like exactly. you're not going to be in alignment with every person you come across in this industry or this world or whatever. So you're practically vetting people or they're, you know, they can vet you before you meet and like saves you the trouble of having to do business with people you don't connect with anyway, right? It's the interview before the interview. Yeah, totally. So are you, um, now, so you're building this big brand and then are the agents on your team responsible for their own lead generation as well? Or have you created such a huge funnel of traffic and in, in leads and business into your team that they're simply managing that flow? It's both because I don't want people that are 100% dependent on us. Um, I want them to know how to wipe their own ass, but we'll wipe their ass for them a little bit here and there. Yeah. Um, so we generate 500-ish leads a month pretty consistently, um, but we also look for them to go out there and create their own business. So, I mean, one of our, our number three source of business last year was open houses. So open houses is something that we, you know, everybody, it should always be your database, you know, and referrals. Um, but number three for us is open house. So we really pride ourselves on teaching these guys how to go out there and crush it with their open houses and generate as much business as they can from them. Um, because we want them to know how to create business, not just wait on business to come to them. So question for you. I hear that you, so you've, you're spending a lot of time creating content. You're learning and implementing and, you know, innovating constantly. You're coaching and mentoring your team and you're handling transactions and clients as well. Um, are you at a place now with your business because you've built, you've established such a solid brand that you don't necessarily need to do traditional lead generation activities or do you still sit down and carve out an hour a day for contacting your past clients and intentionally putting that effort in? Um, or do you just kind of like let it be organic at this point? For me personally, it's more organic now because of everything that I do. And, and I have so much stuff in place. I mean, we have two videos that go out to our entire database every single month. And then we do four, um, what most people refer to as client appreciation events per year, what we now call our friends and family events. Um, just a tip, if you are calling your client, a past client and saying, hey, I wanna invite you to a client appreciation event, you just told them you think of them as a client still. Um, I want my past clients to feel like they're my friends now. Um, so we call them friends and family events. So we're like our next one coming up is an Easter egg hunt. Um, we do it the weekend before Easter. So we do four of those events a year. And so every time we do one of those events, we mail them an invitation, we email them and invite them. And then we also call and text them. So I'm hitting my database usually four times a year. And then we have all of those other um, automated hits between the mail, the email, um, the direct mail, all of that stuff. But four times a year is usually what I hit it. The rest of it, most of it is inbound for me now. I love that. And then how do you decide who you're going to work with and who you're going to refer out? Because I imagine that you've been in the business for what, 20 years now, you've probably got enough business coming, maybe more than you can handle. So do you just cherry pick the ones that you want to service yourself or how do you handle that? Yeah. I mean, all the like lead flow stuff we have with like Zillow leads and um, pay-per-click Facebook leads. Like I don't touch any of those. Those all go directly to the team. Um, because I think if you get in a position where you are cherry picking, it's not a good look for your team. Sure. I think you'll, you'll see a mutiny happen because your team's like, wait, you, you taking all the good leads and giving us all the crap leads that are left over. So I think that that's a recipe for disaster in the long haul if you're running a team. Um, so the only leads that I take are the ones that come directly to me, which is either friends, family, um, farm or referral. That's it. And then even as those come in, if they're buyers 95% of the time, I'm just going to have the initial conversation with them and then set them up with the best agent on my team to help them. Cause I'm just not the best buyer's agent. I, I don't have the time. I don't have the desire. It's just not my strength. I think in an average year, I maybe do three or four buyers throughout the year. And those are usually like a buy sell client or it's a friend or, you know, or to somebody that's really, really cool that I really want to work with. Um, but the sellers that come to me, I typically take all of those. Okay. And, um, you mentioned earlier speaking engagements. So, um, what kind of, what kind of stages are you finding yourself on these days? I mean, where are you being called to present and speak and what kind of topics do you typically speak on? Yeah, I've done events from, you know, as small as 10 people, the biggest I've done 6,500 people. So I've, I've literally done the entire spectrum of, of different size events. 
Um, like I'm going and doing a one day event for a title company this month. Um, I'm going and doing an event. Uh, what do I have coming up? Like I'm going to the Boomtown conference. I'm speaking at their events. I'm going to the bomb bomb conference, like keynoting at their event. Then I'm going to like a small office in Texas and, and just doing a private event for them. So, um, anywhere from real big, you know, thousand plus person stages to private office meetings where somebody wants me to come in and just kind of do some private coaching and training for their team and, um, you know, somewhat of a consultation with their systems and stuff as well. So when you're going to like Boomtown and Bomb Bomb, are you talking about how to successfully leverage these technologies to better improve your process? Yeah, mostly I speak video is, is usually the number one topic people want me to talk on. Bomb Bomb gave us an award for number one video influencer in North America. Whoa. Uh, so that tends to be a topic we, you know, that people want us to talk about. Sure. Um, we also do a lot of talk on open houses. Um, we literally have a trademark process that we use to launch our listings, which all centers around the open house. Um, and then we do a lot of stuff talking about team building um, and team management, automation and technology. It's usually the topics we talk about. Awesome. So what does the future hold? I mean, what's, I mean, I don't know if there's anything left on your plate to put on there, but... <laughs> Where are you going? Um, Where are you headed with all this? This is amazing. <laughs> the, I think the speaking and consulting stuff has been really fun. You know, getting like, if you watch The Profit, I love that show. And so I definitely see um, that being something fun to come into somebody's office and, and break it down and rebuild it up, you know, even stronger than it was before. Like, that's really fun to me. Um, so I can definitely see doing more of that in the future. Um, I flip a lot of properties. I own rental properties. Um, I run a nonprofit. I do a lot of other stuff too. So the nonprofit's a fun thing. We run a uh, potbelly pig rescue, which is kind of random. But um, so my wife and I, we bought a five acre ranch just outside of San Diego. And our mission is to rescue, rehabilitate and rehome potbelly pigs. And so that's like our passion project um, that my wife kind of runs during the week. And then I help out on the weekends with that. Fun. Awesome. Well, if folks want to get in touch with you, either to get you into their office for a speaking engagement or pick your brain or join your team or whatever, um, how, what's the best way to find you? Yeah, best thing is just connect with me on Instagram. My Facebook is clogged up. I've passed my limit on stuff there. So um, follow me on Instagram. It's just at Kyle Whistle. Or if you do want to stay connected with some of the real estate stuff we're doing, we have a group on Facebook. It's called The Whistle Way. And you can just go to thewhistleway.com. And that is a group where we share little snippets from our office meetings. We share what technology we're excited about. Um, we even do some live Q and A and stuff in there. So um, I can't add any more friends on Facebook, but if you want to follow me and what I'm up to Instagram, or if you want to connect on business stuff, the whistle way group on Facebook. Awesome. I love it. Well, thanks again for taking the time and um, I'm excited to follow along your journey and see where it heads. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And as always, I ask if you're loving this content, please make sure to leave a review on iTunes or YouTube and make sure that we continue to attract awesome guests like Kyle and uh, keep getting this great content out there. So appreciate all of you. Have a great day.